Uh, the idea of this project is that all data that is at rest, in other words, stored somewhere, should be encrypted as well. And not only encrypted, it should be uh, protected by policy. So let me go through um, the idea. So the idea is that uh, every time you share, you want to share file or you want to share contents with somebody, uh, the, f the content itself is always encrypted. And in order for another person to have access to this content, he not only needs to have uh, access to the content itself, the file or the, the, the document or the database, but also the encryption keys and pass a policy verification. So uh, what we're doing in, the, um, in this hackathon is that uh, before the hackathon, the, our mode of operation is that the encryption is the encryption is done in the cloud. So what we did in this hackathon was to move to uh, decentralized encryption in the sense that all encryption and decryption is done on the client itself. Go ahead, one minute. Okay, so this is the demo. Basically, uh, I wanna, um, I'm Reynaldo, I wanna share a file. I go and um, get the file, I encrypt it, I ingest it, basically put a HTML shell around it, and I share with, you know, put in Dropbox. I go to another, to a colleague and send a message or, or, or and, and, and basically says, this is where the file is. Now, having access to the file itself does not mean that the person can uh, view the file. So basically nobody can go and put a USB stick and walk out of a company or send an email by mistake, right, with the uh, uh, plain contents of the file. So in the case of my colleague Alina, downloads the file, the file is still encrypted. In order to see the file, she, she needs to consult a policy server that's going to establish her identity. So there's an identity server. It's going to establish whether she has permissions to see the file. And she, if she has permissions to see the file, then she gets the encryption keys and then decrypts the file. Right? So when she does any modifications to the file and she publishes the file, the files back, the file is also encrypted. Right? So basically the rest of the presentation is basically uh, our demo. I'm not going to go through it given the time, but you guys can flip through it or we can, uh, I think maybe we're gonna uh, present uh, later in another opportunity. Um, and I think that's it, that's, uh, that's wrap up for my presentation, my three minutes. So what did you, what did you do this weekend? Yes, yeah, so that's what uh, the problem is we're doing all the decryption and encryption in the cloud itself, in the cloud provider. So what we did this weekend is we moved the decryption and encryption to the client, to the PC. So the keys, instead of being in a key server, I mean, they're still in the key server, instead of the key server or the identity server doing those encry encryption and decryption of the assets, we moved that decryption and encryption to the client itself. And the client itself is part of the ecosystem as opposed to the cloud provider doing most of it. The cloud provider does not have access to the keys. The cloud provider has a key, s the cl there's a key server that can be on the cloud provider or inside the enterprise, right? Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so thanks for that, and uh, and just a reminder to, to everyone to please, uh, you know, keep keep your discussions down um, so that we can we can hear the presenter. And we're going to do a captive portal. Are you guys ready? We'll do that one next. Okay. This mic's live. Uh, left and right to move. Uh, yeah. Nice. Hi, um, so at this uh, hackathon, we uh, well worked on some captive portals. I was just a few of us working on it, and I'll summarize who was doing it later. Um, basically, uh, in the last few weeks, we've been discussing on the mailing list a problem with uh, our captive portal architecture and API, where uh, we're wondering, um, when you have devices possibly in different locations in the network, how can the API server identify um, the device, the captive device, in a way that's consistent with how the enforcement device will actually identify it. So, you know, MAC address, IP address, something else. Um, 
And so we looked at uh, just trying to prototype a few different ways uh, and see if they could work or not work. Um, didn't really do much planning. We sort of just talked a bit about it on Slack uh, yesterday. And then we just figured, let's build on what we did in uh, Chicago and uh, try to reuse it. Um, so this is kind of what we were working on. There's a few drafts involved, um, a lot of virtual machines uh, running on some laptops. Um, you can browse that later if you want. All right, so what did we actually achieve? Um, well, you know, we got some stuff working. We got the uh, system uh, logging in using MAC addresses, logging in using uh, IP addresses, and logging into an API server that is co-located with the enforcement device, so on the same subnet, and also lo um, uh, logging into a remote uh, API server, which might be... Uh, you know, more like what you would see in a big ISP where they have their, you know, captive portal service somewhere in the cloud. Um, so this is kind of the setup that we had uh, for the adjacent device uh, where it's on the same server. Nice little diagram here, not going to dwell on it too much. Um, and as I said, we tested the explicit, uh, sorry, one thing I haven't talked about yet is explicit login versus implicit login. An explicit login is where uh, the API call contains the address of the device itself. So the, uh, the device tells the API server, hey, this is me. An implicit one is where the API server figures out from the request itself the identity of the device. So for example, maybe it uses a source IP. Um, so in this case, I tested only the explicit one because that's what we already had. Um, in the remote device case, you can see I have an API server on the bottom there that's connected on a different subnet through a router to the enforcement device um, and to the... Uh, the user equipment on the right hand side um, and in that case I tested three different cases uh, so the two explicit ones I did in the first case as well as the implicit or inferred login where it guessed the identity of the device from its uh, uh, source IP um, so what do we find from this well it just it worked um, I didn't really have too much problems doing it um, there was some simplicity involved in, in a few different ap approaches. So when the API server was co-located, it was a lot easier to um, actually communicate with the enforcement device because um, you could use a local Unix socket, things like that. So this is maybe, you know, it's not really a big deal for the ITF, but it might be an implementer, sim simpler for implementers. I'm almost done. Um, when we did the infer inferring the identity, the API became drastically simpler. I was actually able to cut out about half the code. Um, so that's something nice if we do go with that approach. Um, inferring the Mac might not be easy, even if you were on an L2 network. I don't think most HTTP, HTTPS uh, frameworks really let you have access to the Mac address or L2 address of the uh, client. So you probably have to do some magic and you know, ask the kernel for the ARP entry and things like that. But who knows? Um, and then I accidentally realized that uh, if you're inferring the identity, the API server needs to be on the same route as the portal, because otherwise you're going to go to, maybe you say you have two IP addresses, you might take a different, um, might communicate to the API server on the wrong IP address and bad things happen. Um, so did that accidentally, it's good findings, you know, for maybe requirements we can feed into any API like this. Um, so who worked on this? Myself, uh, Kyle, uh, Tommy, um, Alexander Roscoe from Comcast, who was remote, and Donald Eastlake uh, was helping me out as well. Right, that's it. Okay, thank you for that. And um, all these presentations, I will get them uploaded into the media material um, after uh, after we're done here today. So that's <laughs> the nets are good. <laughs> Oh, there is. Okay. Let me make sure I get that. Whoops. There it is. Yeah, you can go forward, backward. Uh, probably space would work too. Uh, let me get it full screen for you. Now. <laughs> okay. So um, we worked on v4, v6 transition technologies and an interop between uh, these mechanisms. Um, and if you haven't seen this YouTube video, you really should. There, it's between these two characters, uh, one v6 proponent and one guy who <coughs> thinks NATs are really good. And that was kind of our, our team. So we wanted to test if the new internet would work. 
which is v6 only plus NAT64 to reach the legacy internet, or if we can keep the old internet working forever by just extending v6 and making these v6 um, sharing mechanisms um, work. And we had a, a big lab network we wanted to set up, and the um, expectation was that we would get something looking like on this picture. What it ended up looking was more like, well, it was exactly like this, actually. So we had um, 12 uh, routers, switches, cobbled together, lots of VLANs, lots of static routing. And I think we spent the first six hours uh, trying to get all of this, um, this to work. Um, so what we did when we had fiddled with all the V6 addresses and mistyped them a hundred times, who made V6 addresses this long, I don't know, but it was a, not a good decision. Um, first time, interrupt between um, uh, one open source implementation with this light and one from Allied Telsys. We did interoperability between uh, NAT64, leads 464X, LAT, Lightweight 46. Uh, so two open source implementations and, and the Allied tells this one. Um, during this, we implemented sort of missing pieces as we went along. Uh, Pierre did a DHPv6 PD client. Uh, we worked on a stun library, uh, which did address synthesizes and NAT64 discovery, so that could work behind uh, a NAT64 in a v6 only environment. And we fixed lots of bugs, and uh, as a second sort of thing we did, we tried to verify that applications worked behind all these uh, strange mechanisms that has come up. <coughs> on v6 only plus NAT64, there's a few thing, interesting findings. On the iPhone, which has a very defined ecosystem forcing v6 only support, almost everything works. On the laptop, most stuff works. Um, you can manually synthesize NAT64 addresses, that works. And there are a few things that, that doesn't work that we have to go back and work with you know, vendors and open source projects on. But we did test quite a few applications. Most of it did work. Um, what we learned, building these networks are really, really hard. I mean, we thought V6 should be just plug and play. It, well, um, and these V6 addresses are long to type. And what we've done with NAT64 prefixes, where we sort of split the V4 address all over the space, and put you know, this funny U octet in the middle. That was a poor idea, and I think we should fix that. Um, but at least we got to fix a buffer, uh, buffer overflow bug that we found in, in that process. Um, we tested NAT64444 by accident, because the ITF network has a NAT in it. Um, that also worked, and no one noticed that until they sort of fine looked at uh, the packet traces. Um, media still works point to point, even behind all these NATs and these mechanisms. And of course, these sharing mechanisms are just, just more v4. So uh, we think the future should really be v6 plus NAT64. But that does put new requirements on v6 hosts. They have to do NAT64 prefix discovery. They have to synthesize addresses you know, from, to deal with v4 literals. And they have to support um, DNS, a local DNS64 on the host to be able to do DNS sec uh, for validation. Um, Remaining work, well, can we make V4 run on Singapore? Well, I'm not going to say more about that. And this was the people who were on the project from various um, few newcomers, newcomers both to Hackathon and ITF, and a few old timers. Pierre has won four times, and I think he's banned from ever winning again just because he's hoarding all the prizes. But uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, so we're going to have a discussion on 6052. We might have a discussion if we should put something into v6 node requirements or in a similar document to at least have an IETF statement of what we think is expected from an IPv6 only host. Because we've been focusing only on an IPv6 only host with no connectivity back to v4, right? Because that's been assumed to be dual stack. But I, I, I don't think that's where we should go. I think we should go this way and I think we should yeah, doesn't it? No. No, no, it works. Yeah. As I, as I said to, to Suresh, um, we have to look at V6 node requirements because the node requirements document for V6 has assumed a pure V6 only with no connectivity back to V4. 
uh, it's you know expected a, a dual stack network. I think if we want to go in this direction, we have to add a few of these requirements to be able to, to deal with NAT64 because that has to happen on the host. <coughs> so next up we have Acme Star. Did you guys um is this the right presentation? Did you upload a second one or anything? Okay. Great. So just forward and backward there. Okay, this mic should be live. <coughs> So we worked on Acme Star and the delegation protocol that you can build on top of, uh, of Acme Star. So uh, it's two, two sides of the project. One is Acme Star uh, itself. For those who don't know, the, the proposal is um, a working group item in Acme. And uh, the idea is to extend the protocol to issue uh, short-term certificates that are also automatically renewed by the Acme CA. Uh, we had a remote participant from Spain, Diego, who's implemented the, uh, the latest version of the draft um, on top of uh, Boulder and CertBot. And you can find uh, the relevant pointers there, the, the implementation on GitHub and the, and the pointer to the draft. So um, when, you, when you say has implemented, you mean this weekend? Well, we, uh, is in, we have been implementing this since, uh, we have done this in Prague as well, uh, and we are keeping up with the <coughs> and the and the details of, of the implementation, uh, we have collected them and put in the impl implementation status um, section of the draft of the 01 that we'll be posting tomorrow, as per B BCP 205, which is quite nice, I think. Uh, then we worked here on, on STAR requests, which is the delegation protocol that uses ACME STAR uh, to, to provide the, a credential delegation from a domain name owner to a third party, for example, a CDN. Uh, so I, I was implementing this other draft, which is not a working gr group draft for the moment. We are gaining experience with this, and then we will probably go to ACME again to, to ask for adoption. I did this in Go. Uh, the, the repo is on GitHub as well. Um, and the good thing about this is that I got lots of feedback that I uh, put into the spec. So I forked the spec, and I, and I changed a lot of the protocol flow. Um, so this will soon become a PR for Yaron. And then the third part, <coughs> the third part of the of the project was the, to build this portable CDN demo. Uh, and James, uh, who's a newcomer and and first time hackathonist, uh, has worked on this. And uh, we want to close the loop, um, so to have the delegation working from from the CDN into the content provider, and then from the content provider to the Yakma CA and then back, <coughs> and this is likely to be ready before London so that we can, uh, in London, demo the whole thing. That's it. Okay, so next up is uh, IAOM. And from what I've seen, you guys win the prize for the biggest presentation. Oh, I mean, just most megabytes, not most slides. <laughs> Forward, backward. If you want a second mic, this one should be live. This one. Um, hi, everyone. So we were uh, implementing IOM, which is uh, active work in IPPM workgroup. Uh, this was our team. People from uh, Barefoot and some of us from Cisco implemented uh, uh, P4 did a P4 implementation as well as a VPP implementation, and we were joined by a few others here uh, to test it out, test out what we did. Uh, in short, uh, IOM, IOM is about uh, uh, getting more visibility into the operational network. Uh, it uh, inserts metadata into various encapsulations. You could collect met metadata that is listed out there, and then, then you could get a more higher resolution visibility into what's going on in your network. 
Um, of course, it has several benefits. It makes troubleshooting easy. It could uh, um, uh, it could give you better uh, tools for troubleshooting. Uh, and uh, the way it is defined, we want to do it in uh, at line rate without uh, punting into CPU. And these are some of the drafts that are out there being discussed. Uh, we started the hackathon to, um, given that the data draft is uh, adopted in uh, IPPM, uh, uh, we wanted to see how it can be encapsulated in various transports. So we wanted to try the implementation in multiple transports and also, also interop between <coughs> multiple implementation and try it out in hardware to see if it can really be done in line speed. Uh, the results, uh, we did a uh, implementation in P4 and VPP and interoperated it uh, with V6 transport, V6, V6 encapsulation, and also in VXLAN GP and uh, VXLAN GP implementation was tried on hardware on, uh, on the barefoot uh, Tofino ASIC at 6.5 terabits per second. And uh, a little about P4. So P4 is a language that allows you to define your forwarding plane behavior. It could be a uh, software hardware forwarding plane. So essentially, your forwarding plane initially doesn't know anything about L2, L3, IP addresses, Ethernet, IOAM, any of that. You write your code in P4, you compile it. Uh, that generates your data plane rules as well as some APIs you can use to program it. And suddenly your device um, knows all these things about networking and all the, all the cool ways to behave. Uh, this is what we did. Uh, we did a, a V6 implementation in VPP and uh, in P4. We created a topology like that, and we could, uh, what you see down below is the trace that we collect at the end of the uh, the inbound OAM domain. So we could get a complete trace across uh, VPP and P4 implementation. And P4 is more suited for the hardware. So if it compiles, it can do it at line speed. But this is really a virtual topology that we created. We didn't test for performance. Um, so on the uh, on the the barefoot Tofino switch and hardware, basically we already had an implementation of in-band network telemetry, which is a spec that comes out of p4.org, and now we wanted to upgrade that and support the new IETF IOAM drafts. Um, so changed a lot of the encoding in terms of the data and transport encapsulation formats and added some of the capabilities there. Um, so basically, we change a p4 code, we compile it, we download it down to the hardware, and IOAM is now working in hardware at 6.5 terabits. Uh, so this just shows uh, um, a capture of what was going on. So the left side is the outer VXLAN, the right side is the inner, and in the middle is all the IOAM data that the nodes are adding. So the green is what the source node adds, and the red is what the next node adds. Uh, so we have the source code. Some of the, the P4 v6 implementation and the VPP one is uh, open sourced along with the uh, creation of that topology that uh, we just showed. Um, uh, the VSLAN GP implementation is uh, not open source. So we showed that the IOAM encapsulations, it's feasible. It's feasible in hardware. It's feasible in software. Um, we didn't really have too much trouble getting everything to work. Uh, we did notice a few issues of where um, the draft may not have covered all of the issues or there might be a simpler way to do things. Uh, so we raised some of those issues and we'll be discussing those in the meetings. Um, and then finally, just note that uh, a bunch of this did use open source software and that open source software, VPP and P4, you can go off to their websites, you can build um, switching code and test things and it's great for things like a hackathon like this. That's all we have. Thank you. I have one question for you. Is, is any of that, do you see it as something you would contribute back to those projects? Uh, anything you did this weekend, like going to go back to VPP, back to V4? Is a, it's it's already in the yeah. GitHub. Uh, uh, it, uh, we need to get it reviewed and merged into the master uh, for VPP. Otherwise, it's out there. P4 is also, um, we branched out and we have uh, uploaded the the code uh, in the P4 repo. Yeah, so based off some of what was here, we will probably generate uh, somewhat of a reference implementation and open source code for, for, for P4, but we'll have to base that off what was done here and not directly take it. So have you found any hardware uh, specific issues? Like, you know, is there something that's very hard to do in hardware, like an easier software? Have you found something like that? 
In fact, we did yeah. uh, for the V6 implementation when we were trying to see if the pre-allocated option, it's one of the ways uh, in when OEM data could be collected. Uh, we tried to do that in P4. Uh, there was uh, no way we could do it in P4. So we had to uh, add uh, two separate options and order the options accordingly to get the full trace. So if you see the, the trace is sort of interleaved between the, the software implementation which goes in one option and uh, hardware one in another. But we could order it based on a field that we have added into that. Okay, so now uh, a break from present. We have a presentation-less presentation. Um, slideless presentation. Slideless presentation. That makes more sense. <laughs> Here, I'll turn this over oh, to you. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you. Uh, hi, my name is Aaron Falk. I work uh, for Akamai. We have a project going of uh, doing uh, ECN interop. Now, explicit congestion notification has been around for a long time, uh, and um, uh, in some of the transport groups, uh, we've heard uh, Apple's actually been very uh, enthusiastic about uh, getting it turned on in um, their end systems. Um, and uh, we wanted to, uh, uh, to do a demo uh, to show some of the benefits of doing active queue management uh, with ECN on uh, production equipment. So uh, we have an Akamai server that's got um, ECN enabled. And we've been talking with uh, Chris Tuska from ARIS, who's got the rack of equipment in the back that includes a uh, cable CMTS, some cable modems, and some routers. Um, and so we wanted to do uh, some video running, uh, create some congestion, uh, turn on AQM and ECN, and show that the, uh, the performance uh, was improved when you're doing things like moving the slider back and forth and jumping around in a video stream or um, uh, um, doing, uh, you know, t sort of the time to first bite kind of stuff. This is related to the uh, um, um, always of reducing buffer bloat in the network. The less uh, data that you have queued up in the network, the more reactive uh, you can be uh, between the client and the server. Um, well, so we spent all of yesterday trying to create congestion and uh, actually had a lot of difficulty um, that uh, is, uh, I don't think it's because there's been so much work in reducing buffer bloat, but I think it's mostly the uh, trying to get uh, a, you know, a tool set and uh, um, a, a, a set of data paths that we really understood. Um, and so um, by this morning, we got that worked out. So we've been able to create some, uh, create some cues and now we're working on um, getting uh, the router to turn on uh, the AQM and, and ECN and getting the information to uh, get the CMTS configured. So this is still very much a work in progress. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of boring from a, uh, from a demo point of view in the sense that what we're trying to do is enable technologies that have been around for a long time, but they're not widely deployed. And so getting them running end-to-end uh, -end on uh, production gear uh, is actually kind of useful, sort of a confidence builder. Um, so. Um, uh, and actually, uh, you know, Igor's doing all the work in the in the back, and uh, so I'm. That's why I'm up here, so I can let him continue to make progress. So just updating you. So come by and ask questions. Yeah. Or actually, if anybody's got questions now, I'm happy to. Yeah. No slides. No questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next up, I think is the. Uh, oh, where is it? I think these got reordered. Hold on. I think SAC, SAC on my thought was next. Yeah, just sorry about that. They, I knew there was new ones. So SACM, are you? If you guys are ready. Yes. Hi, I'm Hank. Um, <coughs> Uh, this is a cross work group, uh, cross area uh, hackathon project. Because we are, uh, uh, you can see it from the names of lists here that uh, CS is involved, uh, Fraunhofer Institute is involved, uh, vendors are involved, and of course the uh, famous author of uh, Strong Swan and Layer 2 op uh, VPN pr um, open source tool is involved in this. Um, second telemetry via Yang Push and XMPP Grid project. Um, to give a bit of context, I found this here in the hotel. So push in our scenario is our Swiss Army knife. 
uh, we are using it for everything and it's working great. <laughs> uh, telemetry and basically telemetry based on Yang model data is the fuel for our um, for fulfilling our goals here. Um, the second work group just uh, rechartered and focused on, uh, let's say, three major topics. That is uh, the collection of endpoint attributes that is also security telemetry uh, in order to evaluate them. And somehow you have to push that all through all the components that are involved. So we have messaging and the goals explicitly here now are to find the things you want stuff from. Uh, then how to understand to get it and what to do with it and at last uh, somehow aggregating them, especially with a focus on SWIDs, which are the software identifier and ISO standard. Uh, we are swimmer extension to a transport mechanism developed also in SACOM. So my next slide should be a diagram. It isn't. Oh, but this slide is. Okay, excellent. So let's start with that. <laughs> Uh, we are basically have a big piece in the center of everything, which is a secure information sharing broker, the XMPP grid broker developed in uh, Mile workgroup, uh, as a draft in Mile workgroup. And that's basically doing uh, registration of components that can then publish and subscribe to topics on it. And it's ex actually with content authorization and pushing all the data and publishing all the data all together at the bottom of the picture is a small topology. This is actually on market products that have Yang interfaces on them that are capable of Yang push. So you can you subscribe to the Yang module and the device is taking care of getting the data to you. You're not querying it every 10 minutes. You're not polling it with intervals. The device is doing the work for you and pushing it what you just requested via filters to the Yang push function on the second collector. Unfortunately, uh, not always, uh, and in management it is assumed you always know what you have. In our scenario, we don't. We start with uh, step one. The endpoint discovery knows one thing, does a yang push to it as a step two, and gets all the capabilities. Hopefully one of those capabilities is knowing its neighbors. So it gets stuff back, and then starts to done do another endpoint discovery with this result. Uh, but it doesn't know how to do it. So it does go back to the broker to get the information to actually how to uh, ask for new capabilities. Uh, this is on the left. There's uh, another component here that has a guidance for that. Pushes the guidance back to you. Then again, Yang pushed to the new thing sound. There's are two little boxes at the bottom of the page here. And um, therefore, you do the complete process over and over again. And while this is happening, step seven is happening. Step seven is the refinement of the information you get from all the subscriptions that you dynamically, due to discovery, established in your enterprise administrative domain or wherever. And then you finally get the interesting stuff, the endpoint attributes you're actually interested in from all the devices via the Yang push acquired and then published again to the XMPP grid broker which is then the source for everything in your enterprise, in your administrative domain, that might be interested of some of it. Being it that a USB uh, serial connector was just connected to your switch, an SSH user just connected to your uh, switch, a buffer just overflowed, a watchdog for IPv6 just triggered, or whatever you want, whatever service you have that can report via a module of Yang can be then pushed to the system that is a second collector, which can distribute it, it through the information sharing domain that is the XMPP grid broker. And we actually did this on time here at that table. We have a product on the table that is Yang capable, and we are basically <laughs> actually receiving neighbors, this topology, topology changes, and software inventories, and that famous USB serial adapter you push into the <laughs> device and then you see that someone's messing with it, maybe. So uh, there are resources for this. Uh, if you download the slides, there's a lot of interesting information there, especially in regard to visibility. On change pushes, of course, uh, somehow inhibit you missing some interesting stuff, uh, if you would call otherwise, and now I'm talking too long. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> oh. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, next up I believe was Dots.
if I remember right from the what was here. Okay, and you can just advance the slides with these guys, and that mic should be live. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Carmen Nishizuka from NTT Communications. We did first interoperability testing of DOTS protocol. Okay, uh, to the newcomers to this field, uh, I'd like to uh, explain what is DOTS protocol briefly. So, uh, as you know, the DDoS protection is one of the biggest issues of the internet. So, we need collaborative uh, operation in order to protect the uh, important system from massive DDoS attack. So, DOTS, a DDoS Open Threat Signal Link, solve it with automated and standardized <coughs> signal for DDoS protection. And the DDoS Working Group is aiming to make it standardized in this year. So now we have several individual implementations. Uh, GoDots, which is from NTT, is open source project. All of code is on GitHub. And also uh, we have NCC's private implementation. So this first interoperability test at this hackathon is a giant step uh, for the moving it forward to standardize. <coughs> So what happened in the hackathon? Uh, we drove three projects with seven participants, which includes three remotely, uh, remote participants from Tokyo, London, and Nanjing. Uh, three projects uh, are listed here, and, but our main project is, as I mentioned, uh, fast interoper interoperability testing uh, between two individual implementations. Also, uh, we did a uh, uh, adding new features and extensions to the open source implementations. And also uh, we did, uh, we tried uh, integra integration with the detection system of Mirai botnet. And here's a result of the inter interrupt testing. Uh, we did uh, internal testing before the hackathon uh, within, each, uh, within each company, but uh, we did interrupt testing, uh, which is the uh, uh, middle row of this table and uh, we managed to uh, we managed to make it green with um, a lot of <laughs> changes of the code so what we proved in this interrupt is uh, here uh, we can start and handle a mitigation from each client of a dot signal channel which is a mitigation request of co-op method of put get and delete so uh, we tested the, the handling of mitigation each other Two, between two implementations. Plus, uh, NTC's implementation can act as a dot relay, so we proved that uh, relayed mitigation requests can work over multiple organizations. <coughs> so here's the feedback to the, the dots working group. Uh, we had uh, many implementation experiences, but uh, we found uh, there are many implicit specifications we need to figure out and compromise each other, so we we uh, make feedback of the, to the text of the draft. Appro approximately 60% of the signal channel spec has been proved, proven to work, and the rest will be done before the, until the next IETF. Thank you very much. Let's see who's next up. I believe, I think I saw TLS, if you guys were next. Yeah, because we already did the NAT one. Okay, yeah, this, I think I got the right one. Cool, let that upload. All right. Good to go. So TLS, Transport Layer Security. Um, I feel like I've been doing this for a very long time. And the, the TLS team has been, been working on TLS 1.3 for a very long time. But we hope this is the final lap. Uh, and uh, it, our goal of this hackathon, um, TLS 1.3 has been in last call twice. Uh, and through actually deploying it, we found there were some challenges with regards to middle boxes. So there's a proposal to uh, change TLS to make it more compatible with real world deployment. Um, that's one of the goals is to interoperate various implementations of TLS 1.3 with this new patch set. And uh, as a secondary goal, we wanted to implement TLS 1.3 in a bunch of different applications. So 
Uh, this was a, a diverse team. There's a bunch of people that were here, as well as remote participants um, from individuals from Japan and uh, from London. And we also had a team uh, from the Hackers.mu uh, group in Mauritius who, uh, who, who came together and, at the, and contacted us. And it was great having them aboard. Um, so applications, uh, TLS 1.3. During the hackathon, we added support for uh, the latest draft in Wireshark. Uh, draft 21 in S Tunnel, W Get Curl, a lot of these very popular uh, tools that people use to debug and to, to do HTTP and TLS inside of uh, <coughs> organizations. Uh, there's also this whole list of monads, S Tunnel, Hitch. Well, I mes m mentioned S Tunnel already, but um, a bunch of these different things that are used for developer tools um, supporting Draft 21, which is the current draft, uh, as well as Envoy, which is a reverse proxy uh, implementing TLS. Draft 21 plus, as we're calling it, um, the new changes. So we, we managed to get quite a bit of interop um, with a lot of the different TLS features uh, in the the time between this presentation started and and uh, and now. So there's actually some more of these columns that are filled in, uh, including NSS and TLS Tris. So there's a lot of different implementations from different groups. NSS mostly Mozilla folks, Boring SSL people from Google, OpenSSL, the organization TLS Tris. That's uh, my team at Cloudflare. Fizz from Facebook, Haskell, a lot of these different, and Pico TLS uh, from from uh, from Fastly people, Embed TLS. Hannes was working on that. So quite a lot of interop, and I think we got a long way. So as a takeaway, TLS 1.3 is closer than ever. <laughs> we keep saying that every time. Um, but we're now ready for a lot more experiments to make sure that these, these proposed changes actually work with middle boxes and uh, integration into a wider variety of applications in the developer space. And uh, we've built a strong network of implementers who can uh, now know each other face to face as well as uh, can communicate together and, and you know solve problems. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? No. Uh, almost all of the work of implementing the TLS uh, draft twenty one plus changes were done here. There was a little bit of prep work that some of the teams did, but it was almost all done yesterday and today. Uh, yes, there's there's also um, a couple threads on the IETF list for TLS that came through conversations that came out of this. Um, so uh, generally, we found that the proposal is is probably going to be uh, adopted adopt as is or can work as is with re with respect to middle boxes. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Next up, I believe, is uh, the LP. Saw uh, LP WAN. Yep. yep. Dash three dash oh, oh, do you have a dash three? Okay. Yep. Cool. I can just advance and backward with that. Okay. Hello, I'm Dominic uh, with Orange. And the work I'm going to report uh, relates to the LP1 working group um, and more specifically to this draft. Um, so in L uh, LP1, we're interested in uh, carrying IP, IPv6 uh, over uh, LP1 technologies su such as uh, LoRaWAN and Sigfox and very low uh, date rate, uh, small payload type of radios. Uh, so basically we do <coughs> compression um, and that's already agreed and we have sh uh, built an implementation in the last uh, hackathon. Uh, but in some cases, for example, uh, the IP uh, packet doesn't match the pat pattern that we expect for compression or even the, c uh, the compression residue is uh, too big to fit in, in an L2 payload. So we have to do fragmentation in addition. So what we did uh, this weekend is uh, work on the fragmentation side of things. So our goals were to prove uh, the algorithm that we described in the draft, uh, also to agree on what we think we have described in the draft. Um, and it was also to provide reference code that people could use later on to build their own implementation, maybe more efficient in terms of memory or computation, whatever. 
and also allow performance evaluation because eventually the compression efficiency will be obtained by having very smart rules and so uh, designing good rules means we have a, an engine to, to run it uh, on. Um, so yeah, basically uh, fragmentation was originally described in text in the draft and it's been a couple months uh, since it was described and discussed and we uh, were still discussing. And uh, we had, you know, people came with what if, what if, what if, and it became more complex and we started drawing a state diagram like this one. And we think, we really think now we need to implement that and have running code. So that's the team, uh, six people, three from uh, academics and government uh, institutions and three companies. Um, so what we did this weekend was uh, implement this uh, fragmentation reassembly code that didn't exist before. Uh, we implemented in Python 3, uh, mostly Cedric and uh, Soichi uh, with Inria and Cisco uh, did the uh, d uh, development work and the other members providing the infrastructure, the LoRaWAN network, gateway devices, those uh, devices run Python, micro Python natively. Uh, and also we did a little update to the compression code that where we did it last time. Uh, we did some testing uh, over the LoRaWAN network and also uh, in order to speed up things because we were running late, uh, Cedric and Soichi uh, run uh, over UDP, transmitting just the fragments over UDP. But then we don't see the losses, the delays and all that stuff that we want to see. So what's next? Um, we'll have a side meeting along the working group meeting this week to nail down this uh, fragmentation reassembly thing. So uh, the results from this hackathon will provide food for thought at this meeting. Then we'll integrate fragmentation and compression and eventually uh, hopefully converge on the draft quite soon. And as I said, run performance evaluation and design smart rules for co-op, ICM PV6, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, so for the uh, quick interrupt, you guys are next. Just this one. Yeah, it's thing. just this one thing. Okay, great. Uh, hi, I'm Lars Eggert. I'm one of the chairs of Quick. Um, we basically had an interrupt between a lot of implementations, I think like more than 10, um, around the second implementation draft, quote unquote. Um, you see a lot of green there. The greener, the better. Um, um, we're doing, mo most everybody's doing handshake, most everybody's doing data, um, and some people do connection close with the caveat that we don't quite know what that means. But, you know, um, it means that maybe you don't die if you get a close frame or something. Um, so that that's pretty good, uh, actually. Um, and uh, specifically that we have a bunch of open source and, and proprietary implementations and they're all more or less interoperate is, is, is very nice. Plus we have now, so you see the um, very light row on the right. That's actually the new Google code that so Google is implementing ITF <coughs> quick. Then they basically just today came and we have sort of really started to the very, very first little bits of interop around that. Some of the other ones that have been around longer and are more green, but that's, that's really promising. Um, we have um, a bunch of sessions in the week where we're going to try and iron out some more issues that are preventing us from making further progress. I think the goal for the working group is really to um, ship this thing next year, hopefully. Version one, uh, we're trying to narrow down on only uh, including things that are absolutely necessary for H2 as a workload um, and do everything else later. Um, there'll be some interesting discussions, so if you don't have anything better to do, uh, come to quick. <laughs> <laughs> Read the drafts before you do, as always. Um, any questions? How, how much of this grid became green this weekend? How much of this grid became green? So it, it was completely uh, white, but that was because it was a new uh, sheet on the Excel bot. Um, so <laughs> they have, so, <laughs> right, so, um, dr draft one, which was, was the last sheet we did, um, and draft two don't interoperate, right? So, so basically everybody had to 
start from from zero even to get the handshake green again um so in, in that sense um it was um it was very wide um some of some people are testing sort of continuously we have a slack that's going on um and, and we a bunch of people have public servers up that you can run your client against um and ask questions about so uh, we knew that three or four of them were more or less into operating because people have been testing but i would say more than half um sort of really sort of uh, use the interrupt to uh, try things and haven't really done anything since the last one. So in that sense, it's been very useful. Uh, we need bigger tables. <laughs> 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 or we need to stop having, putting the TLS people uh, at our table. But <laughs> 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 Maybe once TLS works, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you. Okay, next up is I2NSF. Uh, oh, how'd that happen? Looks like the order's different here again. But yeah, um, yeah, if I2NSF, I think, I thought you guys were next. Sorry, it's not coming up right, but I'll, I'll find your presentation. Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Hwan from Songkyungwan University in South Korea. So uh, I will give you a brief uh, presentation about uh, I2NSF pro project at this time. So I2NSF uh, uses NetConf, LastConf, and Yang Data model to provide standard interfaces for uh, efficiently managing heterogeneous network security functions. So in this project, uh, we try to uh, demonstrate uh, I2NSF framework, including the standard interfaces, uh, can be realized using open source software. So this work is a, a student project which involves uh, seven graduate students at Songkyungkwan University. So uh, this is a brief overview of uh, I2NSF framework. So uh, basically, uh, I2NSF I2 Uh, I2NSF user uh, specify the higher level security policy of the security requirement they want and uh, send the higher level policy to the uh, security controller through the consumer facing interface. Then uh, the security controller uh, translate the higher level policy into uh, low level policy for uh, specific NSFs and uh, update the configuration uh, with the low level policy uh, of those uh, network security functions. So uh, this is the basic procedure. So in this hackathon, uh, we extended the uh, I2NSF framework implementation with the following. So first, uh, we implemented a uh, consumer-facing interface using uh, RESTConf and Yang data model. And we also implemented the registration interface using uh, NetConf and Yang. And we also uh, implemented uh, service function chaining to support uh, packet steering over multiple types of NSF using uh, network service header and uh, tunneling protocol, which is uh, GRE. Uh, so this is about what uh, we used in this implementation. And this is the uh, network configuration of our I2NSF framework implementation uh, based on SDN network. So uh, in this implementation, we assume the security service scenar scenario uh, to block the access of the employee on this uh, right hand side or uh, left hand side uh, to uh, Facebook uh, during working hours. Uh, so this slide is about the uh, consumer facing interface implementation. So we implemented uh, the interface using uh, RESTConf and YANG. And for the, uh, to implement the RESTConf protocol, we have used uh, JetConf. So I2NSF user uh, specify the high-level security policy in XML and send the high-level policy to the uh, security controller through the uh, RESTConf. So, oh, sorry. So uh, 
So this slide is about the registration interface implementation, and we uh, briefly summarized our uh, service function chaining implementation based on NSH and uh, tunneling uh, protocol. So we can, uh, you can uh, check out our code from this URL. Yeah, so yeah, that'll be all. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, ah, yeah. So as I mentioned in the uh, beginning of this presentation, I uh, we uh, extended the existing implementation with the uh, uh, consumer-facing interface part and registration interface part, and uh, we also uh, improved the service function chaining implementation using network service header and uh, tunneling protocol part. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, I saw a NAT64 presentation here. And uh, just to reiterate, I'll, I will be uploading these afterwards, and I'm also going to share. There'll be a link where those of you who want to do a demo type presentation on Wednesday will have time for you to do that too. Back. Yeah. Hi. So it's a work. We forked one table into two because we realized we're testing slightly different things for different uh, reasons. So this is a test I've done with the great help of ITF Nox. Thanks for that. So the, the goal is to see how useful is ITF NAT64 SSID because it's here, but apparently not many people using it. And we do not know why, because people are being lazy, or because something does not work, or for some other reasons. So what we try to see uh, is kind of estimate the impact for getting work done on ATF network. So we selected a set of applications, mostly partially randomly, or based on the previously reported issues. So we want to see if anything which was broken before is now getting fixed. And it also not helped me to create a troubleshooting environment so we were able to get anticipate dumps and so on. So um, it's how it looked like. So gray means there was no reason to test or doesn't make any sense. Orange means uh, ne still needs to be tested because I got some issues with Microsoft uh, setup. And red means some issues been discovered. So basically <coughs> everything which need we need to participate in IT working groups like Mitego, Jabber, Etherpad seem to work. Even Skype works, because I've heard some reports about Skype no, not being able to work on NAT64 network. Uh, so basically, uh, issues we found is Marcos client for Spotify does not work. Air display on Android does not work. I do hope if people using Air display on Android, you could also open a bug, because I did report it, but I assume the more user reports the problem, the more chances to get it fixed. And I saw some issues with web based on Telegram. Uh, I'm trying to contact people to find if it could be fixed. So it actually looks pretty well. Also, the main problem is VPNs. So thanks for everyone who came back to me and told me that their VPN works. Uh, I know that OpenVPN works. Cisco employee came and told me that it works for them. Apparently, there are some setups where either vendors do not support V6 only clients or VPNs are not configured properly. So basically, there is nothing in technology which prevents us to use it. It just IT departments need to get some work done. And yes, split tunnels might play some tricks with you, even actually in VF-only environments because of DNS split horizon, right? You could not rely on the fact that if you got DNS response from one interface, you can use that result and send traffic to another one. Uh, yes. Uh, we test a telegram except for minor issue, uh, another instant messenger because I've learned a lot about different instant messengers for the last 24 hours. I did not know so many of them exist. And su surprisingly, some of them work. So we still found some issues like this lovely applications I've never heard before called Steam. Uh, does not work. I assume it's a really show blocker, right, for ETL. We could not get work done. And 
Oh, yeah, and uh, please check your SSH configs to make yeah. sure, yes, that uh, you do not specify host star family <laughs> inet. It would cause some issue in DNS 64 environments. Yes, please t please use DNS 64, uh, not 64 SSID during the week and come back to me or open a ticket to knock if something does not work or if it works actually. And please test your favorite applications you could not live without. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, yes, I did not put it on the slides. I, I tested it during the special SSID set up on the table, but I got the data from NOC. I think the maximum we saw is about 25% of people on NAT64, which I think is slightly higher than we've seen before, which was normally was about 10%. So I do hope it's just beginning of the weeks, not everyone uh, has read an email about NAT64 and so on, so please use it. I'm looking forward to bug reports. Okay, let's see. I don't know what the next presentation is. Let's see. I'll reload here. Looks like uh, Yang, I believe. Okay, thank you. Um, quick summary of what we did here. You've seen us before, usually Benoit. I think I have better hair. Um, we've been up here a lot since hackathon number one, presenting on what we're doing with Yang, with the ultimate goal to make it easier for consumers of Yang modules, be it with NetConf, RESTConf, gRPC, what have you, and Yang module authors better adopt these standards. And to that effect, we actually had a new operator, new to the IETF, come to our table, and we got, it gave him a chance to test NetConf uh, on a, a real device. So we are actively advocating and actively practicing what we want or, or what our goals are. And this particular hackathon, this is a, a summary of what we focused on. I'm not going to talk too much to this slide since I'm going to hear the buzzer soon, and we've got uh, details on each one of these. One of the things we've been wanting to do is integrate this thing we call Yang Suite, which is a way of using an HTML5 uh, web interface, explore and test Yang modules. And we wanted to integrate that with the overall catalog work we've been doing. And to that effect, despite the fact that I hate jQuery, um, we got that working at this hackathon. Additionally, with this uh, Yang suite, we want to be able to continue that uh, ability to build code, code that then can be used to test uh, various Yang models against real uh, NetConf or RESTConf servers. And we were able to integrate uh, the Yang Development Kit, or YDK, in with that Yang suite so that we can produce Python code uh, based on the Yang modules that you're playing with in Yang suite here, and then test those against uh, NetConf and RESTConf servers. One of the things that we're actually working with, uh, working on with the NetMod group and trying to influence the evolution of Yang standards is with this idea of semantic versioning. And as part of our Yang catalog work, we're starting to integrate a derived semantic version, which directly goes into a draft that uh, Benoit will be presenting on Wednesday in NetMod, that allows one to see whether or not a module from revision X plus one is backward compatible with that same module in, in revision X and be able to understand what those differences might be. Uh, we added an API to our uh, uh, regex validator. This will allow us to integrate regex validation into the Yang suite as well. Uh, one of uh, our, our colleagues back there built a test uh, harness, test suite, that we can actually test the examples that are we're putting in Yang models so that we know that those examples will actually work and people will be successful when they're using them. And finally, some of you may have noticed we've integrated the Yang catalog with Data Tracker. So if you're writing Yang modules, you can use some of these tools uh, with uh, Henrik's help directly from Data Tracker. With that said, we always get the question, how much of this was done this weekend? And I would like to point out that while, yes, we did write code this weekend, 
This is a great example of, of work that has been inspired by the hackathon that continues each and every day beyond this hackathon. It will continue tomorrow. It will continue well until we're in London. This work has evolved and we continue to bring new people into it. Uh, both here, as, as we use the hackathon as a checkpoint, but the idea is we want this project to succeed no matter what it takes, no matter how much time it takes. Thanks. All right, a, a lot of uh, passion in that presentation. I like it. And let's see. We are, is this uh, JMAP, the text? Okay. Let's see how this renders. <laughs> does it render the plain text? Yes, it does. All right. That works. What do you know? I can make it. No, I can't make it bigger. There you go. <laughs> That's all right. You couldn't make the group bigger either. We, um, you know how one of the earlier groups said you need a bigger table? I think we needed a smaller table, and we got kicked off so the judges could be here. JMAP had just the two of us from the one company in Melbourne, Fast Mail. Um, the standards changed a lot, and what we worked on during this time was getting the proxy, which talks, JMAP's a mail protocol to replace IMAP and SMTP between, so SMTP submission from clients directly to the same server that's sending out your email, and also it has calendar and contacts bits which aren't standardized yet, but or haven't been written up as standards, but work. So the proxy talks IMAP, talks SMTP, talks CalDev, talks CardDev, to either standard servers or kind of special case for Google because it has to do OAuth. And so we worked on bringing that up to date with the standard. We hope to have more people and we will be coming back and doing the same thing again in London with hopefully a larger group. But we have two sessions coming up, Extra which is for IMAP extensions and JMAP for the JMAP protocol. So come along and have a look. And hopefully on Wednesday we'll do a demo for you. Oh yeah, questions? No, good. All right, so next up, looks like the public, public interest and the uh, 451 stuff. Hello. All right. Great. So um, we've been looking at uh, uh, human rights considerations for protocols and uh, the kinds of problems that can arise sometimes, unintended consequences of uh, protocol design. So we've been looking at um, uh, RFC 7725, which is the 451 Forbidden HTTP Status Code, and this continuation of work we're doing in Prague uh, at the last IETF 99. Um, so if we have a look at... Um, uh, what we've been building. This is all built, uh, almost all of this has been built at the hackathon, 99 and 100. And we've been uh, building three separate modules that uh, one of them crawls content um, on the web and looks for instances of uh, the RSC 451 legally withheld code. Now, um, if we can find instances of this, we can see which authorities are trying to block content and which companies are complying with that. And c that can help us uh, improve the design of the protocol <coughs> So that um, uh, so that it it doesn't get misused for blocking content that should be protected as free speech. Uh, in addition to that, there's a browser extension which Shivan is going to tell you about, and uh, there's also a CMS which was mainly done at ITF 99. So uh, all these feed into the collector, and the collector, I suppose, is is a key part of the work because it combines different sources of of measurements into into one data set in real time. So we're using a real time framework for this. And our goal is really to, to track how people are using it so that we can fix and improve the wording. So it, it's kind of taking research and uh, turning it into an implementation first approach. Um, you can read more about it in the, uh, this month's edition of the ITF Journal as well. There's a piece on uh, the human rights work and the protocol work. So um, this is the uh, information architecture, which I won't go into too much detail on, but you can see that ultimately the output is to support uh, those universal rights, uh, including freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. And how do we do that? With our running code and uh, through our data and metrics that we've collected uh, here. 
So, right, on to the drafts. Yeah, so apart from writing software, we've also been writing. So, this, um, so these are the three drafts that we've been working on and updating uh, this weekend, and they'll all be discussed in um, the research groups and the working groups this, this week. And apart from these three, we also submitted, Stefan submitted an errata to RFC 7725 as, as well. Uh, yeah. Hmm. And yeah, just in case you forgot our names, they're again, they're over there. Yeah, you can uh, check out our GitHub. <laughs> and also there's a live uh, dashboard, which currently has uh, all our un uncut, unfiltered uh, findings. So um, get it while you can, if you like, uh, because we're probably going to need to blot out parts of that soon as we collect more measurements. Right. That's it. Thank you. Okay, next up, I think, is DNS. And is there anyone else after DNS? Anyone, any presentations I missed? Anyone who doesn't have slides but has something to present? Okay. Thank you. And you can just advance and forward. All oh, right, better. yes, thank you. So, the DNS team. So, not as big as usual. So we have uh, we were with ten people. Uh, Manu was a newcomer and the first hackathon, and Hans Seidel was a uh, first I hackathon uh, uh, participant. And the other usual suspects in the DNS, uh, uh, I would almost say the working group, but it's the DNS hack hacking group. Um, so what we have done? So you see less names here people who actually produce some code. The others were mainly discussing uh, uh, good, well, internet drafts, uh, interoperability issues, etc. Didn't uh, really contribute to the code. So these are the three highlights we, uh, we want to present here. So it's DN DNS over TLS in bind. It's the first prototype. DNS over HTTPS by Manu. And then authentication of TLS upstreams uh, by Willem. Um, so DNS over TLS in bind, it's uh, made a good start with implementing this. This is a complex feature uh, and there's now a clear approach and path forward now that did implement parts of it but will be finished after the IGF meeting. Uh, and now with bind uh, there are now three other, uh, there are three open source implementations of uh, resolvers implementing uh, DNS over TLS together with uh, Unbound and not Resolver, which is good. So this is the RFC which is being implemented. Next, DNS over HTTP <coughs> proxy. These are some uh, is a prototype implementation, Python scripts, a server and the client side. Um, you can find the code on GitHub. You see the URL over there. Uh, currently in the in the prototype HTTPS one of of HTTP, sorry, one uh, standard is being used. Uh, later we will look, or Manu will look into uh, HTTP uh, 2. And also one request per connection right now. It's implementing the draft ITF DO, DNS over HTTPS. And so this is the output. One minute? Yeah. Okay. Is uh, the, an, uh, the output of the client querying uh, DNS, DNS over HTTP net for the name SIG fail, so it should fail, DNS SIG fail. This is the output of the code. And here there's a proper DNS sec signed answer <laughs> at the DNS over HTTPS net server. So that seems to be work all fine. Um, the last thing we want to re want to present here is DAN authentication of TLS upstreams. Um, so it's kind of um, a way to authenticate your resolver as a client. Um, what it does, you get NS1 meeting.org meeting itf.org the name out of band by uh, Warren so he Warren Kumari uh, created this the TLSA record for the ITF here this week it's out of band given to the re resolver uh, opportunistic it context it resolves the name and context opportunistic over TLS the resolver and asks for the TLSA record and does a Dane authentication of the record and then you have an authenticated TLS connection with your recursor. So this is implemented uh, almost finished. It will be finished before Wednesday uh, during the cloud, uh, sorry, the, the code launch uh, Wednesday afternoon for demonstration. Cool. Yeah. Uh, did I miss something? I think that's all. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Any questions? No? 
Thank you. Okay, so that wrapped it up for those presentations. I have a couple other things I wanted to go over. Um, judges, I guess we'll, we'll leave it to you to, uh, to figure your stuff out. If everyone could just kind of hang tight for, until they do. Um, so I'm bringing up a, a couple things in, in this deck that I just wanted to, I think it's mostly stuff I, I talked about before, but just things to remind people. Again, I, I will take all these presentations and, and upload them. If you have anything else you wanted to update or change about them, you can let me know later on and I'll update it. It'll all be in the, uh, the meeting material for IETF 100 Hackathon. Uh, that link is, is in the, the wiki. Um, okay. The Code Lounge, I think it, we heard mention to that. Um, there is a link on this slide, but I think also it's been shared via the, the list, and it's also on the wiki. It's, um, you don't have to sign up to use it, but we, we put a sign-up sheet there, and if you do plan on using it, we'd kind of like for you to use that sign-up sheet just to help us see utilization if people find this a good idea. I know many of you are super busy during the week with meetings, and so the last thing you have time to do is to um, go to the Code Lounge and hack on code, but... Um, some of you maybe aren't involved in as many meetings, and we thought, okay, well, this would be a good way to create a space and an atmosphere where you can continue the type of work that you did here um, throughout the week. So that'll be in actually this room after it gets converted into the IETF lounge. And um, we're going to look into providing like some snacks and that type of thing too, uh, just to make it a little bit more uh, conducive to, uh, to hanging out there. So um, just an experiment, hopefully it works, and you know, give me feedback anytime as to what you think uh, was useful about that or what might work better or if it was just a, a horrible idea to start with. Um, the, uh, the Code Lab, so this uh, rack that we have back here, it's gonna continue to be available. Um, you heard a few people are using it for some of their work. If you did find it useful or if you need um, uh, just some VMs that something you want to experiment with if you actually did want to connect into a, a CMTS or have kind of a you know a home cable network um, if there's something that you want some experimental network that you want set up we have some flexibility with doing that let us know that will continue to be available uh, and then uh, this slide doesn't come across very well but if you remember uh, when I had animation, the bits and bytes kind of got covered up by this, whatever we called it, running code day. Uh, so we don't have bits and bytes at this IETF. Um, instead, what we're going to do is on Wednesday, both before and after the plenary, and uh, even well before the plenary if you need, we're going to have space set up uh, in front of where the plenary is with some tables where you can do demos, kind of like what you've done in the past at bits and bytes. And basically, it's a time for you to engage with the rest of the IETF community. We have a schedule where you can sign up. It'll be posted. Everyone can access it. So if you do have, if you want to be able to have more time to share what you did, um, put together a, a demo that, and talk with people, this is an opportunity to do that. Again, something we're trialing just to see how well it works. Hopefully, you find it useful. Um, give it a shot. Sign up. If you have a... I don't know if we posted the link for that, but it's gonna be a wiki page very similar to the Code Lounge. Same type of idea, you can go and sign up and block off the time that you wanna be there to help people schedule you know, meeting you and that type of thing. So if you do wanna do it, I encourage um, you to you know, look, look for that wiki, come see me if you don't find it, and um, let people in your working group know that you're gonna be there. And, uh, and make use of that. And as is shown in this slide, it's gonna be right in front of where the, the plenary is. Uh, anything else? Oh, uh, thanks again to our, our sponsors. Um, while you're waiting for the judges to make their decisions, if you wanna have a look at the, the stuff up here on the table, um, feel free to do that. There, there are some nice prizes. And uh, I think that's about it for things. Um, I know we, I think we probably, uh, we did a little bit better with shirts this time around. Last time they, they didn't show up till well after the hackathon. Um, this time they were actually here. We, we did run out, but um, 
you know, one thing I think it's it's fantastic to see so many people here. We had well over 200 people in the end actually um, sign up, and we're because we had people helping us at the door. We're going to get a count for how many people were actually here. Uh, that's fantastic to see. Um, this has become very popular, which I'm I'm thrilled with. It's also hard though for space and planning purposes for for getting shirts, for getting food. So um, when you start to see the uh, the registration for the hackathon, you know, come out, please uh, sign up early. Um, I mean, don't sign up and if, if, if you're not gonna come, you can always pull your registration down, just keep that link, you can cancel your registration. But it helps us if you sign up as early as possible so that we can get an accurate count, we can do our space and food planning and all that. And um, it, it, it just, just makes it a, a better, better experience for everyone and hopefully we won't run out of shirts. Uh, another thing we're going to do is, uh, um, actually, you know, let's take a break. Alyssa, you're here. Um, we're going to let uh, Alyssa, our IETF chair, uh, talk with us a bit, too. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thanks. So, yeah, one, one thing that I'm working on is deconflicting the ITF leadership meetings from the hackathon so that um, <laughs> more of us could actually uh, come. And I'm sorry that I missed the presentations because I had to be in a meeting um, next door. Um, but uh, it's it's just fantastic to see the the turnout, uh, the growth and the participation in the hackathon. Um, very, very exciting for an organization um, that uses rough consensus and running code as its tagline, uh, but has often been criticized for uh, the lack of the latter. Um, so uh, uh, thank you to, for, to all of you for coming in and spending your, your weekend here um, with us. Uh, one thing that I noticed um, uh, wandering around yesterday that I thought was uh, pretty cool and that I hadn't particularly uh, noticed at previous hackathons, but maybe it's been happening, um, is uh, people kind of wandering over to other tables and getting engaged um, in solving a new piece of their problem that um, they hadn't thought about too much or that they just sort of noticed like, oh, hey, I'm, uh, I am I have this other thing I'm working on where I really need to understand service discovery better and like here's a group of people who really understand service discovery. Um, why don't we go chat and um, and maybe understand each other's projects a little bit better? Um, I thought that was that kind of cross pollination was uh, was pretty cool and um, we should try to figure out how to how to make that happen a little bit more often. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone for all your work here. And I will not stand uh, in the way of, of the prizes being handed out. <laughs> so back to you. OK. Um, so while we wait for, for our judges, you guys uh, obviously made it tough for them with uh, so many great presentations. Um, you know, we, we experimented with a lot of different things this time. Um, this having this box folder that you could upload to and, and presenting from here. Any, any kind of feedback? Did people find that worked well? Was it too limiting in terms of the way the presentations came through? You know, what do you think? Any, any feedback on that for, so we can plan for next time? Yeah, overall pretty, pretty good, but better at least than what we had before of uh, switching and, okay. Um, one thing, it's, it's more difficult than you might think to have a, a shared folder that people can very quickly, you know, whoever they are, dump stuff into. Um, most mechanisms uh, don't let you do that very easily. So data tracker and other things at all kind of has to know who you are before to let you put stuff there. So we're going to continue to try to work with things, but um, I thought this, this was a bit of an improvement. Um, what else? Any, any other feedback? Of course, you can always give me more candid feedback or feedback to someone else to give to me if it's particularly bad and you don't want to hurt my feelings. But, but actually, I, 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 I welcome the criticism because that's the only way this is going to get better. So uh, uh, good things, bad things, all good to hear. Yeah. So you mentioned OK. So you want to know how many people here actually wrote some lines of software while. Just coming here and, you know, writing and 
Yeah, okay. Well, let, let, let's see a show of hands. It's going to be hard to count, but I think you'll get a sense for, was it most of the room? So, so a very good number. That, that is fantastic. Um, congrats to all of you. And thank you. But, you know, at the same time, I do want to um, point out and I want to encourage people to come who, who aren't going to write any software. Um, one of the things we try to promote with the hackathon is that it, it is a good way to learn a new area. It is a good way. We do like having people here who are um, experts in, in the field if they're just very familiar with the draft. If you happen to have, be an expert at software development and with the, uh, the, the drafts that you're writing, hey, that's fantastic. But not all of us have that skill set. So um, whatever you can bring, whether you know the specs really well, whether you code really well, whether you're good at doing uh, UI work that's going to make for a, a nicer demo that actually shows how your stuff uh, plays out, that, that's all great. Um, Alyssa mentioned the working across teams. That's one of the things I love about this hackathon. Um, it's great about the IETF in general, and I think that spirit carries over to this where you see teams helping each other out. And uh, that's kind of a tricky thing with the prizes. We actually got some pretty good prizes here. So we, we, we see that all of you work really hard regardless. It's not a hard thing to get people here motivated. Um, we like the prizes to be something nice for you to take away, but um, we, we certainly don't want to lose that collaborative spirit because that's one of the most important things here. And welcoming new members in and taking time to bring them up to speed uh, those are all things we, we really, really like to see. We've added some new fields to the registration where we ask you a bit more information, like is this your first IETF? Are you staying uh, for the IETF meeting or are you just here for the hackathon? Um, we're kind of continuing to evolve that. I hope you don't find it too overbearing that we're asking too many questions, um, but having those metrics is actually really nice. So uh, that's the reason we're asking them because one of the goals is to bring new people into the IETF. And so we like to see, hey, is this helping with that? And um, it just helps for, for planning as well. Uh, anyone else have anything they want to say? I'm kind of running out of. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe that's, um, let's uh, help me to take a look at that afterwards. And so, so, so the, the, the suggestion was um, that, that there is some, uh, so like some open source tools that um, are provided out there and mechanisms that where you can create presentations and upload them and people can share them. Uh, and if it's something that, because one of the things we like to do is I, I don't know who all is going to be presenting ahead of time. Um, we, we have like 200 people here. Actually, we, uh, it, this was a, a record, I think, if, if you look at the uh, registration list, we're like 220 or something crazy like that. So the problem is any of you might want to upload something, and most things it's like we have to invite you or pre-configure you. Perhaps as a hackathon project, someone wants to write something that takes the list of regist you know, registered attendees and gets them uh, authenticated in the data tracker or something. Uh, but the, the, the proposal here was maybe we could look at this, this tool, which is actually a little bit better for creating and sharing uh, presentations. And as long as it lets anyone, you know, put stuff there and lets all of us see it, that's, that's the key. If we can do that, that would be better. And maybe we can create, you know, nicer quality presentations. And, and, and maybe it'll make sharing them a little bit easier. This, I know, was a bit clunky because none of you could see the folder, only I could. Uh, if I invite you to it, then you can see the folder too, but that's kind of a pain to invite 200 or whatever people. So, uh, but again, a maybe a little bit better than what we did last time. So I'll, I'll get back with you. You can show me that tool and we'll, we'll take a look at it. Uh, and it looks like uh, our judges are coming back, so. Yeah, thank you to our judges. Are you going to do the announcements? I will. Do you need to present anything? No. Okay. I just need to talk. So yeah, thank you to the the other three judges besides me. I guess are all new judges. Uh, Greg, have you judged before? 
No, so yeah, we're all, they're all new judges. So particularly thank you to, for, for coming in and doing that. Okay, we have a lot of interesting stuff going on here. Um, I think this was a really good hackathon. They're all really good hackathons. I think this one was probably the best one. We had more participants than we've had at an Asian uh, hackathon, and, uh, and we really got a, a lot of good work done. So it was hard to figure out which ones to give what whimsical prizes to. And apparently there's some good stuff up there. I was looking, you decide what you want, but um, I like the headphones. So if somebody wants to take one of the headphones and give it to me later, <laughs> it's, it's cool. And there might be a prize for you in a future hackathon if you do that. <laughs> anyway, best overall project we gave to DNS. Uh, they've won this before, and they consistently do a lot of good work at the hackathons. So the DNS people go pick up your, well, first we got the photo op. Who, where's the photographer here? Yeah, okay. So we'll do a photo op, and then you can go pick your prizes out. Um, you get first pick. And while they're doing that, uh, for the next one, we, we took the two tables that had split themselves up, the IPv6 tables, and we put you all back together. So there's the IPv4, IPv6 transition stuff and the NAT64 testing, and we gave you together best input for the Scotch boff to the universal deployment of IPv6. <laughs> and thank you for the work leading in that direction. Uh, come on up for a photo and then you get the next pick of the lovely prizes contributed by by Cisco um, uh, Cisco funding anyway and a collaboration with the Secretariat um. <laughs> next up we put uh, we, we gave our Korean colleagues the um, the award for best student project I2 NSF group And thank you. This is, I think, your fourth hackathon, if I remember correctly, um, something like that. And thank you for consistently coming and doing this. Come on up for your photos and, and next pick of the prizes. The Yang people are also no strangers to getting awards here. Uh, we've got you for best long-term work. You're, you're really consistently every hackathon accomplishing quite a lot along the road to, uh, to the goal of making Yang universal. So thank the Yang people for their work as well. And cue up for your photos, uh, including the guy whose hair is better than Benoit's. So I, I personally like Benoit's hair, so I don't, I don't know what you're about. But. <laughs> TLS, best remote participation, about uh, one third of their participants was remote and they accomplished quite a lot with that. So TLS, thanks again for preparing us for the unmonitored internet of the future. <laughs> Applause please, yes. That's, that was what the pause was for. Wait, I'm in the picture too here. That, that, that means I get one of the head, headsets. I'm sorry. I am. I'm, I'm trying. Dots. Dots got uh, the best open source project. And we're very pleased to have uh, some, work, some work being done against um, denial of service attacks. So. It's the, isn't there more? It's not just the two of you. Let's get... Get the rest of you in the picture. They're taking the pictures. <laughs> it's all right. It's just that. Oh, uh, you know, there's that too. Well, we have there's we have a couple of others anyway. Sackham, Sackham, best cross area work. Uh, had a lot of stuff going on there, and thank you. I think you have to queue up for the camera here. It's, uh, the prize picking is getting 
Here's the TLS group getting their pictures taken. And we, we have one more, so don't go away. We're just pausing for the backup. Say TLS. <laughs> We're doing a bubble sort up here. All right, and, and we're still queued up with the SACM people. Bear with me for a moment. For the people queuing up for prizes, please move over toward the wall so that there's room for the picture taking. Thank you. Okay, and the final prize, we're going to give this out real quick. Did you get that one? Best interop testing to the quick group. So come up quick and get your pictures. And that's the last time I'll make that joke. And thank you everybody for your participation. After the after the crowd dwindles here, people who did not get t-shirts get priority for claiming whatever prizes are left on the table, and then the vultures can take the rest. And feel free, there will probably be a couple of sunglasses or something left up there by the time they're done. Thank you again for participating in the hackathon. Everybody come back in London and do it again.